Okay, Philippians chapter 3. Let's get serious, okay? I don't know what's happened the last three weeks, but uh, we're going to have fun anyway. Father, thank you tonight. We pray as uh, we think of camp life beginning and just this weekend coming up. Really ask that you would minister. Thank you for grace and mercy. Mercy takes away what we deserve, and grace gives us what we do not deserve. We thank you for that. So we pray that you bless this class tonight, Philippians 3. Help us to have understanding in the scriptures. Not just understanding so we can put it in our notes, but personal application in our own lives. For what good is the Bible if it's not personal? So we really pray there would be an application by the Spirit, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. So we thank you. Bless our night tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, Philippians chapter 3. Thank you for praying. I know that uh, I, I was figuring this out the other day. 32 hours in the air. 78 hours in buses and cars. That's 110 hours of traveling. Three countries, 36 messages, not including wraps. 12 locations and 2,600 people. And still alive. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but actually, to be honest with you, I came home Wednesday night and I just woke up today. No, I mean, I've been awake, but I've been like, I said, it's tonight, Friday. Said, What's today? I said to my wife. She goes, it's Friday. You have to teach. I said, oh, really? It was kind of quite a revelation to me that I had to come out of the house, uh, which was interesting. So actually, very good. The first night I, I, I fell asleep, I think I went to sleep at 8 o'clock and woke up at 10 the next day. That meant 14 hours I was unconscious, which, which is good, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Maybe, unless your brain cells. Isabel Palmieri said that sleep is the greatest uh, medicine for your, anything that's wrong with you that you wow. could think of, because it rejuvenates the body. And I thought, that's interesting. Isabel knows, because she lives in Africa. And um, she, she is right. On Saturday, I drove, well, it was 12, 16 hours to the Sahara Desert in the north. Then the next day, another six hours to Burkina Faso, preached four messages, drove back after Sunday service, and another six hours back, preached the main message in Volgatanga, then drove 14 hours by car back to Accra, Ghana, then got on an airplane and flew eight hours to England, and then the next day flew another eight hours. So I, I thought like I was on like a, it's like a roller coaster ride, is what it is. Somebody saw me yawning come off the plane and said, oh, are you tired? I'm like, <laughs> duh. <laughs> so then I get all these nonsense calls from the office trying to get me to come in or make me think that if I'm not there, something's not gonna go well. Like, big deal, you know? Like, I've been gone for a month, what's the difference? Anyway, Philippians chapter three. Are you ready, Molly? Okay. And uh, I love how this starts off. And we're gonna, we're gonna see a number of subjects here in Philippians three that are very important uh, for the Philippians and for us personally. Finally, my brethren, Rejoice in the Lord. And how many times did we say the word rejoice was in this epistle? Do you remember? Come on now. It's not that far away, is it? 119? No, that's way out there. Like 19, maybe? It was, it was the, the word mind and the word rejoice were constant occurrences in this epistle. In other words, if you have God's mind, you're going to have joy. If you don't have God's mind, you'll never have joy. You'll just have a joy that's got nothing to do with God. 
Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous. But for you it is safe. This is a very important verse. As we've heard from Dr. Stevens for decades about the importance of categorical doctrine and hearing something 35 times before you really get it. He would, say, he would say that you need to hear something about 35 times before it begins to make an indent in the brain. And he's saying that for me to say the same things to you is, to me indeed, is not grievous. And this means it's not tiresome or tedious for me. Paul was saying for me to continue to repeat the same things over and over is not tiresome or tedious for me. And you know, sometimes when you are... Uh, church planting and teaching Bible school, and it's, it's just year after year. I know that in, we were in Togo this year, and, um, and the messages are messages that are really, Pastor Stephen said at one time there was only seven messages in the Bible, and many derivatives of those messages, but seven major doctrines in the Bible that we would concentrate on in preaching. And so you, you over and over again, and sometimes when, the, when you get up to preach, you keep thinking to yourself, like, I've said this like last year, or I said this three months ago. But for me to say the same things is not tedious. It is not tiresome. And I will not be delayed by that kind of thinking. For me to say the same things to you is not grievous. It's not grievous. Now, to some people, they get a little bit bored with patterns of teaching and, and teaching in teaching doctrine and teaching in patterns. They, they either have an emotional bent to their brain, so they need to be stimulated emotionally, rather than think with God in a pattern of thinking. That's what doctrine is, is thinking with God, patterns of thinking, in a process that's going forward progressively. And that's really what it's all about as far as what we should be growing in. And so for anyone who is discipling somebody, this would be a continuous thing that would take place over the course of many, many years. I find myself sometimes after maybe being in West Africa since 1986, 25 years later, we're going back and talking about the same things over and over again. It's constantly the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the finished work, the body of Christ, uh, the gospel of God, missions, soul winning, uh, who you are in Christ, these things never change. And it's not, for me to say them over and over again, is not tedious nor tiresome. It's safe for the listener. In other words, the, the listener doesn't, if I do not receive this continuously for the rest of my life, then I'm going to find myself in a place of danger. But if I'm going to be in a place where I'm listening to this, it's very safe for me. Over and over and over again. Because it's amazing to me how some people that were really established in patterns of thinking and how to think with God and over the years, how interestingly they depart very quickly. Whereas you can find people that maybe 10, 15 years later, they think differently than they used to think. And something has taken place in their lives. And they just got a little bit tired of hearing the same thing over and over. They were looking for something what? Something new. I need something new in my life. I need to hear something new, something that will stimulate me, something that's exciting, something that will uh, you know, really provoke me, or something that is, is not just the same thing over and over again. And you know, this is what Paul is saying. It's not, it's not grievous for me to say the same thing. For you, it's very safe. It's, very, it's a very safe thing. And really, for us to have our minds established in that way. And maybe there's some people here, you've been in Bible school for one or two years, and maybe 30 years from now, you're going to be hearing the same things. You're going to be hearing the very same things you heard 30 years later. And if that's tedious and tiresome, then something's wrong with your brain. Your brain is, is, is a, a brain that needs some kind of an emotional stimulation uh, to keep you going. You need something to keep you going rather than doctrine, patterns of thinking, and truth. So Paul says, it's not grievous, it's safe for you. This is very safe. That's why it's safe for me to study the Bible. Over and over again, the same doctrines, the same truths, over and over again with a fresh application. 
Because we are living in different times and I'm different than I was two, three years ago. And uh, what the doctrine of patience means today is different than what the doctrine of patience meant 10 years ago. So this is very safe for us. And Paul says, you know, you might think, do you, you ever think, why did God write uh, three Gospels, synoptic Gospels, that are almost like so similar? It's incredible how similar they are. What do you think the reason for that was? Because you need to hear it from three different viewpoints, the very same thing. Over and over again, you hear the very same thing, and on and on it goes. And this is vitally important. This is what is really important in Christian schools. This is what is important in Bible school. This is what is important in, in Christian education. This is what is important in the pulpit. Sometimes you get up and, you know, I, I remember like you hear Dr. Stevens use certain verses many times during the year. And I could either say, well, what's going on here? Or this is very safe for me. This is very safe for me. This is not tiresome and tedious. This is very safe for my life and the importance of my life. Other than that, you know what? There is a devil who's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And how is he going to devour? He's going to devour people's thinking. He's going after their minds. He's going after their minds, you know? I hear this all the time, you know? I, I, love, I love what they said this year in Ghana. The president, we were in Ghana for two days and the president died of Ghana. And uh, he had cancer, I guess. And um, he made a statement to the Prime Minister of England. He said, I would like you to take all of your money and never give us one dollar again in Ghana. Because with your money comes the stipulation that we must be liberal in our thinking towards homosexuality and lesbianism. So you keep all of your money, we don't need your money. We'd rather be poor people with convictions of truth than have your money and be people that are prostituting truth. I thought that's an interesting statement to the Prime Minister of England from a Ghanaian president. And then the guy that took his place is born again. And he said the very same thing. He said, don't think I'm going to change any different than what President Atta Mills said. It's, I have the very same convictions. Keep your money. And I like that because if, if you're not careful, you saw how, how things have eroded in this country. Why? Because people changed the way they were thinking. And they, they oh, this is, here we go again. These Bible-thumping, Bible-believing, truth-promoting people. And they don't realize how safe it is for the country. How safe it is for people to think like that. But they would say, oh my God, here they come again. It's irksome, it's tedious, it's tiresome. I can't take it anymore. And that's called the wearing down principle of the devil. Satan is interested in wearing people down. This is what he does. He's not trying to like immediately get me to believe a lie. He just like to wear me down and wear me down and wear me down and wear me down so that when I'm really tired and I can't take it anymore and situations are different than they were, that I will change. I will just change a bit rather than listening to the same thing that's safe for me. Preaching the same things. You should, you should hear the same things we preached this year in Togo. Oh, I went right at, I went right at loose dress. I went right at drinking, right at homosexuality, right at adultery, right at, uh, all, you, you name it, all kinds of things. Went right at those things. Don't, don't, and by the way, that's never going to change. You think it's going to change? You think that the, the world and your response to me would change the way I think? You got another thing coming. Sorry about that. It's not going to change. Current trends aren't going to change it either. You know? It's amazing to me how well, you know, you got to get with the times, Pastor Shabelli. What times are those? This, is that a newspaper called the Satanic Times? Huh? Is, that, is that what that is? Is that the Times you're talking about, the Satanic Times newspaper? Mm hmm. So he said, it's safe, it's, this is very safe for me. And then, you know, we talked about this in Philippians chapter 1. Many, remember what he said in Philippians 1? A lot of people preach Christ out of envy and jealousy and strife and contention. So I know Christ, and he said, I'm glad that Christ has preached. But I would like to also say this, that when people have the wrong motive, they might bring the message, but their motive is wrong and God will deal with their motives. And he's going to talk here something very interesting about 
what he calls the dogs of the concision. You know, Paul didn't mix words when it came to false teachers. And we are like, I just, I find a lot of people are just so, you know, we just got to get along with everybody and like just, you know, we love them and they got to believe in priesthood. And let's appreciate, listen to what he says here. Beware of dogs. Now this is an interesting word. Beware of dogs. This word for dogs, K-U-O-N, means dangerous dogs who feed on anything. They're not pets and they wander around. They're unclean and contemptible. They will eat anything that's available. He calls people that are legalistic dogs. He calls them dogs. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Now this word he's using here, beware, is the word blepo, B-L-E-P-O. And it means perceive in your mind, observe, and be aware of, and do not be blind to. Perceive in your mind, have a mental perception, be aware of, observe, don't be blind. Beware. He's saying beware of three things, dogs, evil workers, and the concision. I thought, this is an interesting portion of scripture here. Now, the word concision is the word katatome, which means a butcher who mutilates you and mangles you. That's interesting. That's what the word means. Katatome, concision. A butcher who mutilates and mangles you. Whereas the word circumcision is peritome, and that means if it's spiritual, if, if it's the circumcision spiritually, it's done the right way. There's no mangling and mutilation. It's done the right way. Well, this is interesting. He calls them the dogs of the concision. He said these are the dogs who mutilate and mangle believers by the things they teach and the things they do. He says watch out for them. Watch out for them. And like sometimes maybe living in Baltimore, you don't get to meet a lot of those kind of people, per se, all the time. Maybe you do. I know in Africa, every time you turn the corner, it's something else. It's some new doctrine, some new preaching, some strange way of thinking and doing things, something that's very popular, something that has been elevated, something that I was watching, they had this one program and the guy just puts his hand on the TV, and if you touch the TV with his, your hand to his hand, you're healed. And these people are sickos. These are the dogs of the concision. And I don't care if they're born again. I have a little bit of discernment knowing that what they are perpetrating is nothing but a lie that mutilates people and destroys people's capacity for truth in the grace of God and the finished work. He, Paul didn't say, well, there are a bunch of guys that are just misinformed. He says they're dogs, evil workers, and they're of the concision. His adjectives for them were not like the sweetest. You know, a lot of Christians are too nice to the devil. You know that? Just too nice to the devil. I, if I would come up against a Mormon, I wouldn't be nice to a Mormon. And I definitely wouldn't vote for one. That's just my conviction. Wouldn't be nice to one and wouldn't vote for one either. Anyway, wouldn't be nice to a Jehovah Witness. They're dogs of the concision. That's what they are. They mutilate people. They mutilate and they mangle people. They destroy people. He calls them evil workers. He doesn't say that like they're just misinformed. He says they are evil workers. And the word they use is kakos. And it means they are worthless and wicked. He says, this evil is a worthless, wicked evil. And they affect people's hearts and their conduct. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. <laughs> so how'd you like to be uh, meeting Paul someday? And he, uh, you know, you just happen to be a, of a different persuasion in your teaching. He calls you a dog, an evil worker, and of the concision. And you say, where's the grace in that? There's a lot of grace in that because it's connected to truth. The dogs of the concision. 
And so he's, he's, why? He's warning his church because this church will be under the attack of legalistic people, people with wrong motives, people coming from the outside. When, I, when you hear about things, I mean, I, was, I, I just heard something about Jack Kyle's church. It makes you want to vomit what, what's taking place in that church, you know, and, and what's going on with people falling in, into sins of molesting children, pastors and leaders. You wonder what in God's name is going on today. And, you know, it's, is it ever addressed? Do people address it from the pulpit? Should it be addressed from the pulpit, you know? that this is a, a satanic evil that is, is trying to infiltrate and permeate the church and to, be, uh, and to really watch yourself because the devil's going after leaders. Paul says, watch out for these enemies. They're coming from everywhere. And he, he, he wasn't, and so he says, I need to keep warning you about these evil workers, these dogs of the concision. Why? Because they never stop coming. They never end. Evil, as a practice, gets worse and worse. So you're always going to have people out there. And, and you know, I think sometimes if we stay in our little cocoon, our Christian cocoons, you know, we're just, oh, I'm always in the body. I'm always in the body. I'm not, don't take this in the wrong way. I, I, I don't know anybody. I don't know any lost people. I never, oh, I don't even know what you're talking about. I've never met anybody that has wrong teaching. It's because maybe you never go out of your house. Maybe you never, go, you never go out and do anything, so you never meet anybody. But if you go around the world, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. Wrong teaching, false teaching, evil workers, the dogs of the concision, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And they're attacking the church and they're attacking truth. Everywhere. And if we, if we just keep ourselves in sheltered places all the time, then when we hear people talking about it, like in a class tonight, we say, I don't even know what it's talking about. That's never happened to me. I guess I must be blessed. I guess maybe you're not blessed. Maybe you're not blessed because you're not out in the marketplace meeting those kind of situations and those kind of people so you can present truth to them and maybe they can be told exactly what they stand for. But of course, we don't like confrontation, do we? You know, 21st century Americans, oh no. No, they've been Obamaized. And no confrontation. Let's, let's just be nice to everybody. Everybody be nice to everybody. Everybody be nice to you, you know. And let's just all be political, okay? Oh, we don't want to make any enemies. Well, you know what? I look for enemies. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know what? What can I do today to make somebody my enemy? If it's the truth. <laughs> Take it easy. I'm just joking. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. I'm confused. I travel too much. So Paul's saying, I want you to watch out and I need to keep you safe and I've got to keep teaching you doctrine and truth and the finished work and humility and the gospel and to live as Christ and all the principles that he gives them in the book of Philippians about the mind of God. Why do you think he keeps talking about the mind of God? Because if you've got the mind of God, you're going to be safe. If you don't have the mind of God, you cannot be safe. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you've, been a, if you've been a Christian for 30 years and you stop studying and receiving the mind of God, you are not safe. You are not going to be safe. The enemy's coming one way or the other. Some people think just because I've been saved for 30 years, like I've got it all together, I know what's going on. I, you know what? The tactics of the enemy change constantly. And if I stop thinking with God, then I'm not living in a safe place. I'm not in a safe place at all. It's shocking to me what's happening to some people. Some well-known and renowned people who were pastoring and, and what they're doing, left their wife, living with another woman, drinking, gambling, all kinds of things. Not jumping off Niagara Falls though, right? Not yet anyway. What people are doing, and you know what? They, something happened, they stopped thinking with God. They stopped the phroneo pattern and process of thinking that Paul talked about through the whole epistle. And he's saying, you Philippians, you know what? There's something that's very safe for you. And that's for me to tell you these things over and over and over again. It's not tiresome and it's not irksome to me. And it's not tedious. I've got to do this. Are you with me now? Yes. Verse 3. For we are the circumcision in which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he might, that he has thereof, 
he might trust in the flesh I the more. Now, we're going to see Paul bring in a contrast here between confidence in the flesh and confidence in the spirit. Now remember, there's nothing wrong. It almost can seem like somebody's arrogant if they have confidence in the spirit. There were things that Paul said in his letters that would almost, if you, if you just read them straight, you think the man's proud. The man's proud. But no, he has confidence in the Spirit of God. So there's a contrast between confidence in the flesh and confidence in the Spirit. And I was thinking about some different contrasts. Do I have confidence in the Spirit's ability or the ability of my own flesh? How many people really have confidence in the Spirit's ability versus their own flesh being able to take care of everything? I'll handle this crisis. I'll handle this problem. I'll handle this difficulty. I've got the ability. I know what I'm doing. I know more than God does. Is it confidence in the spirit or confidence in the flesh? When it comes to my ability. Next. Am I led by the spirit or led by the flesh? Do I have confidence in the spirit's leading or do I have confidence in the flesh's leading? The leading of the flesh versus the leading of the Spirit. And the Spirit will lead me in, in directions I have no idea of, of where He might take me in my life. We have no idea at all. Are you with me tonight? Yes. You sure? Yes. Some of you look like you're half dead. <laughs> yeah, okay. The heat? I mean, in here or is outside? It's not, heat. it's not hot in here. I'm the only one sweating. <laughs> Am I confident in the leading of the Spirit? Or am I confident in the leading of the flesh? Huh? I could never do, I could never go to China. It's because you're confident in your flesh. Instead of being confident in the spirit. That's really what it's all about. You know, I, I've heard people tell me this a lot of times. Like, well, I'm not led. Well, how, how do I know whether you're led or not? Maybe you're just a backslider. Maybe you just want to be led by your flesh. Maybe you never think about taking a real, you know, oh, I just love the church here. What if you could be sitting here tonight and I could be standing here tonight and you could be totally out of the will of God. And you could be smiling and praising the Lord and saying hallelujah and convincing everybody you're in the perfect plan of God. And you could be so far out to lunch you wouldn't believe it. Hello? He said, I didn't come here to hear this tonight. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Why? Because I don't know. The Spirit knows, right? The Spirit knows where I should be and what I should be doing. Imagine I get to the Bema seat and God says to me, all the time you spent in Baltimore was a waste of time. Ooh, that might be really painful, huh? You were there too much. I wanted you in, I wanted you in a place where there's no Christians. Mmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I don't mean to really get really difficult tonight, but it's just coming that way. Is it the spirit? Do I have confidence in the spirit's leading or confidence in the flesh's leading? Well, I'm too old to go anywhere. Really? C.T. Stud went out when he was 55. Wow, until he was 85. George Mueller went on the mission field when he was 70. Jonathan Goforth was 71 when he went to Manchuria. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, that's for the younger people. Mm hmm. Confidence in the Spirit's leading or confidence in the flesh's leading? Many, many Christians across this country are flesh-led. That's all it is. It's the leading of the flesh. Nothing more than that. And, God, and guess what? I'm not in the position to know where, what's going on with anybody's life. I've got to deal with myself. That's why I'm never concerned. People say, like I love how they tell me, we really miss you. I said, I don't miss anybody. <laughs> when I'm in the plan of God, you don't see the, you ever hear Jesus say, Gee, I really missed the father. I wish I was back home. He didn't say that, did he? He just says, I'm hearing the voice of my father. No, I'm in the plan of God. If I'm in Africa and I'm there for a month, I'm in the plan of God. I don't miss. Miss what? Miss hot dogs? Miss the Olympics? Miss Jim Markowski? Not a bit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> don't like to be so impersonal like that, but you know what? Wow. And if I'm here, I don't miss them. I don't miss them either, because missing is almost sounds like a sentimental thing. Yeah, rather than just saying, I love them, and I appreciate them, and I pray for them. I don't miss anybody. I don't miss anybody, because they're in the plan of God, I'm in the plan of God, and there's a hallelujah to that. 
And that's, say, I don't like, I, I don't agree with you. Good, be wrong your whole life. <laughs> miss, miss, hit or miss. Okay, let's move on here. So next, am I confident in the spirit's life or the life of the flesh? Am I confident in the spirit's life in me or in the life of the flesh? Next, am I confident in the spirit's work or the flesh's work? What the spirit can do in his work or what the flesh does in its work? Am I confident in the spirit's fruit or the fruit of the flesh? Am I confident in the spirit's discernment or the discernment of good, and it's usually good flesh we're talking about here, or the discernment of my flesh? Am I confident in the spirit's mind or in the mind of the flesh? Am I confident in the spirit's faith or in huh, flesh faith? Am I confident in the spirit's victory or in the flesh's victory to make things change? And I say this, when we read on here, we're going to see that if the spirit is gaining in my life, the flesh is losing. But if the spirit is losing, the flesh is gaining. It's very simple. He must increase, but I must decrease. And so, let's look at this a little bit more here. Because this is very interesting. He's going to talk about the things he, he could trust in. All right? He's going to talk about the things he could trust in. And I think there's quite an interesting list here that he gives. He gives you eight things here. Seven, I'm sorry, seven. And four of them happen by birth to the Apostle Paul. He says... Now, I'll look at verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think that he has thereof, he might trust in the flesh, I the more. Almost sounds like he's proud, right? <laughs> if anybody could trust in the flesh, I could trust more than any of you in my flesh. Circumcised the eighth day. That was a good one for the Judaizers, the dogs of the concision. He just wanted to make sure that they understood he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and a Hebrew of Hebrews. He said, I got these things by birth. Circumcised the eighth day, these were things that were done to me and, and what I was born into. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, my credentials in the flesh are quite something. Then he says, as touching the law of Pharisee. I was set apart to the law so much that I had it memorized. There was nothing about the law I did not know. As touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he gives us seven things here. Seven things that would seem to be outwardly seven great advantages for him in his flesh. And he says, as far as all that is concerned, it's useless. He says, I want you to know that there's, there's, I can have no confidence in any of this. Verse seven, but what things were gained to me, those count, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now, point one here I'd like to make. It's, it's uh, winning and gaining Christ versus the loss of things. Winning and gaining Christ versus the loss of things. I was talking to a couple in um, Burkina Faso. And they were driven out of Mali because of Sharia law. The country just became like fundamental Islamic. And they had to flee the country. And I asked them like, you know, was it worth, I mean like you went there and tell me, what do you think about what's going on? And they said, listen, this was led by God, allowed by God, took place by God, and we just counted a great privilege to have had the opportunity to have been driven out. I thought to myself, these people are interesting. 
And, and really they, in other words, all, that, all the preparation, all the finances, all the setup, all the housing, all the putting of the children in school, all of the, uh, all of the effort, everything that took place, all of the trips there, it's kind of like it's all down the drain, isn't it? But what things were gained to me? I gained Christ. We got to know Jesus Christ in the middle of it all. And this will be great for our time in the future as we grow with God. So we're talking about the gain versus the loss. And you know, as, as Westerners so often are, and as many people around the world so often are, we always are in the business of calculating, are we not? Well, if I do this, I'll get that. If I do that, I'll get this. If I don't do this, I won't get that. If I do this, I won't get that. We're always in this kind of calculation thing. But I really thought this was interesting today. I was talking to Pastor Scheller about this on the phone. He says that Paul says something very interesting here. Counting all things lost and then suffering the loss are two different things. Paul says, I count it all loss. Hegiomei. Not only do I, I consider it and reckon it to be loss, a lot of people would talk about that. But he said, I, have, I don't just count it loss, I suffer the loss. I'll take the loss. I have actually, I haven't just considered it, prayed about it and said, this is what I'm going to do. But it's actually happened. It's actually happened. You can imagine Dr. Stevens may be standing there without a microphone after this great thing that took place in Lenox. And you can think about loss everything. Everything was lost right? Everything was gone. Christ wasn't gone. So you gain Christ, but you might lose everything. Now, no one wants to follow that kind of a Christianity. Come on, let's face it. That kind of a Christianity is not what you'd call on the popularity charts, is it? Like, yeah! I heard, you know, they, uh, Richard Wormprand said, a preacher that preaches the truth will likely never be followed by anybody. No, honestly, very, he says, you know, if you really preach the truth of the Bible, you're not going to have a great following. You're not going to have a very great following at all. You know, you're going to have some disciples that are going to follow. But Paul says, here's this win-loss thing. And if I see the importance and the value of winning Christ, nothing else really matters. I mean, some people have taken incredible losses for the sake of following God. Some people have, maybe it's been, it's been a, a marriage partner. Maybe it's been children. Maybe it's been health. Maybe it's been finances. Maybe it's been reputation. Maybe it's been a job. Maybe, who knows what it might be. But you know what? That means nothing compared to gaining Christ. In other words, gaining Christ is far greater than any loss I could take. And it's the only thing that would actually really soothe my pain in the midst of the losses. That the, 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 the balm of Gilead, that Christ is there. And so as he ministers to me in the midst of these things, and it's really incredible when I, I, I just saw some of the things that take place in, in the northern part of Ghana and the northern part of Burkina Faso, and I see people that have really prayed, uh, just uh, paid an incredible price to follow God and really what's taking place in their life. And maybe they're left with nothing. We're, we're thinking of like Muslim converts who are driven out by their family. They're, they lose their job, they're driven out by their family, and they're not even allowed to stay in the same town that they grew up in. All their friends are gone, but to them it's nothing, it's nothing at all because they've won Christ, amen? And you just think about like, you know, my God, I lost my cell phone. I, I know, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but I am. You know, I mean, what, what happens, I'm amazed at what, the little things that can destroy a person's walk with God. The little things, somebody didn't say hi to me. Somebody didn't recognize me. Somebody took my parking place. Somebody did this or somebody did that. All these unbelievable things that go on that all of a sudden people are bent out of shape about. But if you've won Christ, and Christ has won you, then suffering loss, what does that mean? Lost your reputation. So? So what? How'd you like to be nailed to a cross and you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords? 
You're nailed to a cross and butchered on a cross. I mean, that's something, isn't it? Just think about what took place in the lives of the apostles. But there's a far greater thing when you think about winning Christ. Christ has won the victory for me, and I've won Christ. And so loss is nothing. What is loss? Really? It's loss is a lot. It's, it becomes, the devil likes to make loss very big. You know, I lost my job because of Jesus. So, what you like me to do? Huh? It is what it is, right? I wonder how many people would lose their job if they really took a stand for Christ. Huh? Really, really, really just like, just said, I'm going to just really walk with God and, and whatnot. I wonder what would really happen. I'm not telling you to do that tomorrow or Monday. I'm just saying, you know. It's, it's amazing. But when I understand the value of winning Christ, that Jesus Christ is all and he's in all, this is what Paul is saying, that there's so, it's so much more valuable to have won Christ. And so let's read on here. It says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but guess what? Remember the dogs? Remember, remember the dogs of chapter 3, verse 2? Huh? Remember the dogs? You know what this dung is? This is the refuse that comes from a dog. I'm sorry, it's what the Greek word says. Okay? Count it all but dung. And he's talking about dog do. <laughs> I'm very sorry. It's called, the word is skubalon, S K U B A L O N. It's refuse that is the filthiest thing, the filthiest thing that comes from a dog. He says, I count everything dung, dung from a dog, that I might win Christ. Now, can you imagine how valuable many Christians think some of these things in the world are? Huh? An Olympic gold medal, dung. I'm sorry for all of you Olympians. <laughs> it's okay. Nothing wrong with that. You know, I guess if the person is born again or whatnot. If they're not born again, what good is that Olympic gold medal, you know? Did they, did they testify for Christ? Did they live for Jesus Christ? Well, what, what, does it, what does it get anybody anyway, you know? It's amazing to me. I mean, think about it. Somebody becomes a multimillionaire. Dead. Bye. See you later. Dung. Money's dung, isn't it? You're not taking it with you, are you? <laughs> Reputation. There's a university in Massachusetts. And it's got a huge hall with my name on it. Not my, but my uncle's name. What, what good is that? It's dung. I call it the dung building. <laughs> it's just a big dung building. You know, it's like, big deal. They call it Shabelli Hall. Big deal. It's just dung. That's all it is. It's just refuse that comes from a dog. That's what Paul says. He says, I'm not saying it. He's saying it. I do count everything but dung that I might win Christ. He said that's all it is. It's worthless. It's useless. This is what the word means. That which is, that which is refuse from a dog. And then he uses another word. It's called the filth of the mind. The filth of the, of the mind. That which is animal waste is another word for it. For skubalan, animal waste. Boy, he picked a tough word here. He says, everything that I thought was valuable, the tribe of Benjamin, remember those things we just talked about? Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, a Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, a Pharisee as touching the law, blameless, the righteousness of the law. He says, all that is refuse from a dog. Wow. I was a good Catholic. No, you were. Dung. I was a bad one. Dung. No, really. I'm a good person. I gave my money to the poor. Dung. You just dunged your money away. Huh? Without God, it's useless. It's refuse. I, I mean, I, I think I'm reading that right. I count everything what? I count but dung that I might win Christ. He's saying everything. I count all things. How many things? 
loss. You know how many people put value on so many things in this world? Huh? Paul says it's just dung. It's just it's refuse from a dog. That's about how I and that stinks. It's useless. It doesn't even smell good. All of it. Oh, I became a I, I got my doctorate. Dung. Dr. Dung. I got a master's degree in uh, advanced computer technology, uh, Master Dung. I'm sorry to, to, to hit it so hard, but it's just, let's just be honest about it, okay? If it's outside of Christ, it's useless, right? It's useless. It, makes, it means nothing. This is, what, this is what he's saying here. To win Christ is everything. The rest of it, don't let it affect you. You know, sometimes Christians get so wowed by the world. Did you know what he got? Wow, he got that award. He got this. He got that. He did this. He did that. Dong, da, dong, 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 dong. <laughs> oh, whatever. He got the Nobel Peace Prize, dong. Peace Prize, dong. It's all dong. Yeah, he's the governor of uh, Maryland, dung. Oh, I wish I was the governor of Maryland. Why? For what? Z compared to being a, a Christian who loves God and walks with God, it's just dung. That's all it is. And Paul just calls it what it is. That's why he was stoned and hated. And that's why they tried to kill him every five feet he went. Why? Because he said the truth. And they didn't like it. Dung. Wow, oh, provoking, thought-provoking. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, other than gain loss, the second thing that he really hits upon here, in other words, the, the win and the gain versus the loss. And I was just, you think about some of these amazing heroes of the faith that we read about in missionary books that really, they, it was like they walked away from things that people would never walk away from. C.T. Studd, William Borden, Adoniram Judson, David Livingstone, uh, some of these men, they walked away from things that people consider to be very valuable. Money, inheritance, education, popularity, recognition, and they just said, means nothing compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It means nothing. So the second point I think that's important in this chapter is what it means to know Christ. And he talks about that in verses eight through 10. He talks about knowing God, to know God, not just to win God, okay? Let's, let's think about winning God being point number one. Okay, Christ has won me, and I have gotten saved, and I've won Christ, and we, we are there in fellowship. We have this positional truth. But now, I have an opportunity to get to know God day by day, moment by moment in my life. And is there anything more excellent than that? There's the question. See, there's the question. It does relate back to the first point, the gain-loss thing. Because some people, years up the road in Christianity, they don't think it's that important to get to know God. They are, oh, I know God. Oh, I know God. Oh, I know God. I see this all the time. I, I see this all the time. I was talking to one man. This is what the man said to me. Pastor, the Holy Spirit has laid it on my heart to become the president of Nigeria. I said, it wasn't the Holy Spirit that laid it on your heart. It was some dung producer that laid it. I didn't say that. I just, I'm just making application tonight. I said, come on. The highest calling you could have would be a pastor in Nigeria planting a church. And now you want to be president, which is absurd because you, you can't even become a selectman, let alone a president of Nigeria. What a hyper-spiritual weirdo you've become. And you went to Bible school in Nigeria. You went to Bible school in Hungary and graduated from Hungary, Hungarian Bible School, and whatnot, four years under the teaching, and this is what's happened. You see, when you stop knowing God and getting to know God, I don't care if it's me or you or anybody, it's amazing what can happen. 
It's amazing what can be produced. The, he says it's the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He said, there is a preeminence and a prominence and a superior thing in my life. It's getting to know God. That's what he means in verse 8. The excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And that's why he says in verse 10 that I may know him. I want to know God. I, I have a purpose in my life and it's getting to know God. And I don't think that I, you know, well, because I'm such and such, this many years old, I know God, or you don't know God because this or that. You know, I, I, knowing God is a progressive, personal revelation that's taking place all the time in our lives. Getting to know God. And when I stop getting to know God, I'm done. I'm done because I remain right where I am and there's no more progress. And God is moving on, but I'm standing still. That's why I think it's so important for us to grow and to take new challenges and to just receive from God and say, you know what, I'm not going to just sit back and do the same thing I've always done. I want to know God and I want God to take me where I'd rather not go. Getting to know God. And this is so key. Isn't that what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24? Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, the rich man glory in his riches, the mighty man glory in his strength, but let him that glory glory in this, that he understands and knows me. This is what you glory in, knowing God. Knowing God, that's where our glory comes from, not in how big a church is. Say you, had a, say you were in a church of 5,000 people, but you didn't know God, so tell me what good the 5,000 person church is. You personally do not know God. So how is that helping, how is that large church helping you? It's got nothing to do with anything. It's getting to know God. I have to get to know God. In the middle of a small church, a large church, a, a mid-sized church, whatever it might be. I have to get to know God. This is the key to my life. Knowing God, I've, I've been won by Christ, I've gained Christ, and now, point two, Paul says, I myself as an apostle, after 30 years, I want to know Him. If Paul could have revelation from heaven, three years in Arabia, and be making this statement 30 years later that he wants to know God, then what does that mean for me? That means I want to know God. I want to know God every single moment of every single day. And when I get to know God and God is leading me progressively and I'm hearing from God, and that means getting to know God is not, getting to, uh, not letting people know God for me. Did you ever have somebody do that for you? They, 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 they know God for you? They got it all figured out what you should do with your life. Huh? And God forbid if you burst their bubble. Hmm? God forbid if you burst their little bubble, you know? And uh, you do something contrary to how they think it should go for your life. It's amazing to me. It's amazing. I remember that happened to me in Massachusetts. They said, how can you go to Africa? You are the director of the Bible school. You lead the outreach. You're the assistant pastor and you head the Christian school. I said, how can I go with my feet? <laughs> How's that sound? You mean all these things that I do are what's keeping me from taking the next step or shouldn't they be the stepping stone to the next step? Huh? Should be the stepping stone, right? <laughs> it's amazing. But yet other people are more concerned with their lives and how you help them to live as a believer and are not concerned with Maybe many people that could get to know Jesus Christ in churches that could be planted, Bible schools that could be opened, and countries that could be penetrated. They're not concerned with that. They're just concerned with how you fit into their little monopoly plan. Huh? And they don't want you to know God for yourself. Getting to know God. I think this is so key. So let's take a 10-minute break. We'll come back and we'll talk about the calling and the prize and the mark and the one thing we do. Amen. Is the cafe open? Yeah. Well, hallelujah then. You are free.